we welcome you to worship today. And as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer.
We are here, gathered in this sanctuary. Oh, sorry. I'm surrounded by the light of God on this first Sunday of February. We are through the longest darkness, and the light stretches a little bit longer every morning and evening. We gather here in this light to praise God and to lift our prayers in word, song, and silence. We are gathered here with open hearts to feel the gift of light and unity. We gather here to join those hearts with one another and with God's. We gather to share the light of God in the joyous times and when our hearts ache and we feel alone. Come, feel welcome to bring your open heart however it is feeling this morning. Feel welcome to join in the light of God knowing that you are so welcomed and so wanted. God of light, Let us so open the doors to our hearts and accept your love and the love of those that move in our lives by your hand. We are here as your people to pour out our praise and thanksgiving to our Creator. See us and know that each of us brings you to each of our God of light, as we celebrate you and the light. Taught me to love, to share, to 
to struggle for bread and justice. Your truth incarnate in my life. So be it, Jesus. Amen. We'll join together in a silent prayer of confession. My friends, our confession has been heard and grace granted. God has heard what is in our hearts. Through Jesus, we are offered grace, mercy, and unending forgiveness of our shortcomings. We see your grace and lift our hearts to the Jesus Christ. Amen. have been given and received and it is time to pass the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. and welcome to children's time. I am having a little bit of a confusing time trying to figure out the passage of the Bible that we're supposed to read and learn about this morning. Maybe you guys can help me. In the book of Matthew, we hear Jesus telling folks that he's preaching to that are listening to him that they are salt and light. They're a salty light, which confuses me because I thought we were all humans and the people back then were all humans. But Jesus is telling us that we're a salty light. The only salt light that I can think of is one of these things, a salt lamp. But that doesn't seem right. Does that seem right to you? You don't think so either? Okay, well, we're going to have to think nice and hard about this. Well, we know that sometimes the gospel stories and other parts of our Bible aren't really talking in what's called literal sense, which means like for real, but they talk another way called metaphor, which is a big fancy way of saying that they're saying it in a way to help all of us understand what they mean. So maybe you and I can try and think about it that way. Like Jesus wasn't really telling us that we need to grow up and become a salt lamp because that doesn't make much sense to me. So let's think. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. Did you know that there's all different kinds of salt? There's not just the one that we put on our food or the one that mom tells us, watch your salt when we're eating a bag of chips. There's, there is that salt. But there's also special salt that makes our roads less slippery in the wintertime because it melts the ice. There's salt that keeps our pools safe and kills all the bacteria so that we don't get sick. There's salt that gets mined right here in Saskatchewan that's called potash that's used to help our crops grow and be strong and healthy. Or there's pink Himalayan sea salt that when light shines through it, just like this lamp, it's said to be good for us. So, 
let's think about that and think about what Jesus said. When Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth. I don't think he meant that we taste salty when we, when we lick our skin. And I definitely do not think that Jesus meant that we're salty like the young folks say today, which means that we're kind of grumpy about things. I think it means that we're good and we're honest and that we're worth a lot because all of those salts are really important. So they're valuable. They're valuable to the people who need them. So let's think about the light part. Jesus said we were the salt. We thought, thought about that. Let's think about the light. Jesus said, we are the light of the world. And if he didn't mean the salt thing for real, for real, he probably didn't mean the light thing for real, for real, like we couldn't light up our thumb and be a lantern. The light thing, the light thing. What do we use light for? Well, anything that we want to see, right? We need light for pretty much anything that we want to do. We also need light for our plants to grow, for them to be edible. We need it for us to grow and be healthy. We need it to help warm us. Yes, even in Saskatchewan in the wintertime, there is light that helps warm us a little bit. We need light to show us where we're going in the dark. And certain types of white light waves can even heal our bodies and help clean the air. Kind of like our salt lamp here. So if we're the light, we must be heck of good people. I think that's what Jesus meant, that we're always, always all useful to God and that we're very important in the world. So Jesus didn't mean what he said, that we're the salt and the light, not for real, for real, but he gave us some pretty big compliments when he did say that. We are valuable, we're good, we're honest, we're important, and we're useful in the eyes of the people around us and in the eyes of God. Well, my friends, thank you so much for helping clear up the confusion about this passage, and I hope that it helped you understand a little bit as well. Have a great week, my friends. Bye-bye. Our first reading today is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under the bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And our second reading is from Psalms 112, and we could go over the refrain, please. <laughs> Blessed are those who fear God. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Riches and plenty shall be in their house. Their righteousness enduring forever. They are a light in the darkness for the upright, being gracious, compassionate, and just. It goes well with those who lend generously, who conduct their affairs with justice. 
for the righteous will never be shaken. They will be kept in remembrance forever. They will not live in fear of bad news. With resolute hearts, they trust in God. Their heart is steady. They do not fear. In the end, they will see their enemies' downfall. They will distribute freely to the world. Their righteousness is enduring forever. They will hold up their heads in honor. The just shall trust in God alone. Hear what the scriptures are saying to the church. Acceptable unto you, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. Last week, both the Sermon on the Mount that we heard in our scriptures and the sermon here at Calvary, in those you all heard who is blessed in the eyes of God. And the answer was beautifully simple. You are all blessed. You are blessed on the days that come easily, that you can't help but have a smile on your face, when God is near. You are blessed on those days where absolutely nothing feels okay. You feel lost and God could not be further away. You are blessed on those in-between days, the ordinary days, when a little bit of mo both might happen and you aren't even looking for God. Both Jesus and our friend, Reverend Nora, assured you last week that you are blessed and that you don't even have to work for it. This week in our scriptures, we visit another section of the Sermon on the Mount, here for our sermon at Calvary. Jesus' longest recollected sermon is too much to tackle for just one Sunday, and the lectionary that we use is broken up into four parts, four weeks. And reflecting on what I know about the teaching styles at the time, and the feelings that I have on the works that we have of Jesus, I think that the sermon was given organically, that it wasn't given all at once, and that breaking it up into four different parts is okay. And what I mean by organically is that it's not polished, rehearsed a speech that happened from a pulpit of stone that Jesus gave to the crowd after crowd, town after town, the Messiah experience in 40 minutes or less, Bring the kids, we have snacks. Some theologians give this sermon a 40-minute cap. That's how long this sermon would have taken if we were to speak very slowly, very carefully, and leaving a little time at the end for questions. This was all three of the chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. But that's not what I picture when I read these words. I picture an entire day a day where the crowd is gathered and moving about. They have lively discussions and they hear what Jesus and the disciples have to say, what they came to teach there. And within those lively conversations, with children jumping up and down off of people's laps and people milling about, I wonder if we hear the Beatitudes given as an answer to a series of questions of, who's more blessed, me or them? Or maybe something like that. Perhaps, once the idea of being blessed had trickled out through the crowd and circulated, someone who didn't feel very worthy worked their way to the front to sit near Jesus. But teacher, where is my place in this? I am, um, insert your shortcoming here, and speaking directly to that person, and as great speech givers have a way of doing simultaneously to each other person in that crowd, saying, but you are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your God in heaven. And what must that have been like to hear? This passage is uplifting, it's empowering to us even 2,000 years later. It draws us near, and it draws us to be the greatest version of ourselves. And the greatest version of themselves, as they were, where they were, as their starting point. I can't help but wonder if that moment lingered a little bit longer in the air from all the others of that day. 
imprinting themselves on the listener's hearts. Similarly, I picture another part of that day with fellowship and conversation where one of Jesus' students was showing a sign in one way or another that they were going to put in jeopardy their goodness, their righteousness, the path that they were on. And Jesus felt called to deliver a wee kick in the pants to that person, saying, you are the salt of the earth. (laughs) But if you lose that saltiness, well, if you lose what's good and useful inside you, you the results aren't going to be what you like. I think what this chunk of the Sermon on the Mount is saying to us, this salt and this light, are trying to gift us that we are enough. We are the salt and the light right here and right now. We need to strive and work for that. We need to strive to let it shine through, but we are enough is what Jesus spoke. The Beatitudes tell us that we are blessed. The salt and the light tell us that we are enough for that blessedness. Melissa Camara Wilkins writes on being enough, you are enough. I believe that. That you are enough just as you are, just as you were made to be. But I want to be clear about what that means and what it does not mean. Because you are enough does not mean that you have been measured and considered and judged and finally earned the label of enough. It doesn't mean that you worked long enough, tried hard enough, presented well enough. It is simply who you are. That there is you and you are enough. You don't have to be more or do more or buy more to be who you were meant to be. That's what I mean when I say you are enough. You are enough does not mean that you are the final product, complete and finished, all done growing and changing and learning things forevermore. You are enough does not mean that you are all power and perfect either. You are enough does not mean that you are everything. The pursuit of enough flies in the face of the pursuit of everything. Having a good grasp on enough means that you don't get to everything, and you certainly do not have to be everything. You are enough does not mean that you have to be self-sufficient. It does not mean that you need anyone or anything else. It means that you understand how much you do need, how small you are in this great, grand universe, that you don't have to be one inch bigger than that tininess. You are enough absolutely does not mean that you never need help. When you know you are enough, it is easier to ask for help. It is easier to admit your weakness. You know that your imperfections and your difficulties don't reflect on your worth because you are already enough just as you are. You are enough does not mean that you are flawless or that you never make mistakes. You know that you make mistakes. You know that I make mistakes. I know that I make mistakes before I get out of bed. Every day. That doesn't mean that my flaws are the truest, most important thing about me. It just means that I acknowledge them. I see them there. They exist. High flaws. You're mine. If being enough means being perfect, then you are enough is just another reason to hide your true self. You hear that kind of, you are enough, and you think, well, I know I'm not perfect, so either I'm not enough, or I need to hide who I really am. No. You are enough means that you were made to be you, as you are, on purpose. It is no mistake that you are this person, in this place, in this time. You are enough as you are, mess and all, broken, beautiful, showing up for life every day. That's all you have to be and all you have to do. You are already enough. You are enough means that you can grow and change and continue to become because 
you aren't trying to prove yourself. You're just trying to be yourself. You are enough means that you don't have to be strive to become worthy, more valid, acceptable, or more loved. You are already all of those things. The things that you want to be more of, more open, honest, true, more authentic, more free, more connected, more intentional, more purposeful, those are all expressions of your enoughness. They aren't about changing yourself. They're about being yourself. You were enough before. You are enough now. And you will continue to be enough as you become more of who you were made to be. And believing that, when the world keeps whispering otherwise, it's a brave act. This is the enough that Jesus empowers and inspires and warns us to hold on to in this passage of the Sermon on the Mount. Not to hide, not to lose or change or to undermine that. God calls us to show others our enough and acknowledge everybody else's enough. In doing this, we will see God's kingdom of heaven as it is every day. Amen. You join me in prayer. As the sun rises to be the light of this physical world, so you rise before me to be the light of my spiritual path. Give me the assurance that you have placed along this path all that I will need to meet the challenges of this day. In, those, in the path, in those in our lives, work for those who feel weary and heavy this day. Brighten their footsteps and shine your light around them, God. Those that have found themselves in darkness and loneliness, the loneliness and darkness of mental illness, physical illness, those that are experiencing grief and loss, those that have challenges that seem too great to face, let them draw from your light and remind them that there is light to be seen inside them, that this light cannot be snuffed out. Wrap in your warmth and comfort those that are healing and remind them what it is to be gentle with themselves. This broken and weary world needs every moment of light to clear away the darkness of corruption, greed, war, famine, God. We need your light to see what we can do to each help our planet. Those steps that are the exact same on our path as with everybody else's path in our community and in our wide world. In expectation, I await discovering you. We need you, God. We all need you this day to remind ourselves that you are always with us in the moments of light and dark. We draw on the ancient words that your son lifted to us and we, as, as he was the light on the earth and each of us are, calling you by whichever name feels most like home to us this day, we will say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
we gather as people who follow the light. Whether we wait for the sun rising, or light the candle in the night, or experience the light in the darkness of our heart, we see the light by which we may live. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. May his light burn warmly within us and shine brightly out from us for all the world to recognize. Jesus also said, You are the light of the world. May we remember that we are made in the image of the Creator and know that the light within us is that same light that Christ sets in our heart. Go and let the light shine upon you. March in it and know that you are a light for others in this world. And all God's people said, Amen.